Hi, this video will be an introduction to mathematical groups. And a group is a binary structure, so it's a set which we'll call G with a binary operation star. And this set has to be closed under the operation and also follow three axioms. So before I go into the axioms, I want to clarify what it means to be closed under the binary operation. So really it just means that for any A and B in the set G, a star B must also be in the set G. So if you have elements A and B that are in our set G, but somehow A star B is outside the set G, then the set G cannot be a group with the binary operation star. And sometimes people will consider this another axiom, but for the most part this is just assumed in the definition of a group. So it might not always be explicitly stated, but it is definitely something you need to look out for. Now in order to be a group, the structure has to follow three axioms. The first axiom, which we'll refer to as G1, is that the binary operation is associative. So for all elements A, B, and C in G, we need A star B star C to equal A star B star C. The second axiom requires that the group has an identity element. So there must exist an element E in G such that for all X in G, E star X equals X, which equals X star E. And the final axiom requires that every element of the group has an inverse. So for every X in G, there must exist an X prime in G such that X star X prime equals E, which equals X prime star X. So every element has another element in the set that essentially undoes it or sends it back to the identity. Now notice that the definition does not require the operation to be commutative. A group that has a commutative operation is called an abelian group. So an abelian group is slightly more restrictive in its definition. Now that you've seen the definition, you might be wondering why is this important? And the truth is that the idea of a group is actually a very natural idea to come up in mathematics. So what I mean by that is that groups have been around for a very long time, long before we ever gave them a name. You can say that we have in a way known about groups since the introduction of the negative numbers. With the introduction of the negatives, we get the set of integers with addition to be a group. The set of integers is obviously closed under addition since for every integer x and y, x plus y is also an integer. The set also clearly has an identity element with a zero element. Also, every integer has an inverse in the set of integers. And finally, we know that addition is associative. So the set of integers with addition qualifies as a group. And to go one step further, since we know addition is also commutative, we can actually say that this is an abelian group. And this was really the first group mathematicians studied, but definitely not the last. For example, you may have heard of Fermat's little theorem that states that if p is a prime number, then for any integer a, a to the p minus a is an integer multiple of p. This theorem went unsolved for nearly 100 years until Euler proved its truth in 1736. Although Euler successfully proved the theorem, he continued to look for other ways to prove it. In his third proof, which he produced in 1758, he unknowingly used the group of integers modulo a prime number p with the operation modular addition to prove Fermat's theorem once again. Lagrange, another influential mathematician, also unknowingly used ideas from group theory in 1770 when he introduced the idea of permutations of roots used to solve polynomials of higher degrees. So even though the definition of a group was not explicitly given until 1882, there are multiple examples of groups that were used before that time. And I say that because I want to make it clear that it wasn't as if someone came up with the definition of a group and then coincidentally found a plethora of examples. It was actually the exact opposite of that. There were many groups that were unknowingly being used by mathematicians to solve difficult problems long before the axiomatic definition was given. Now of course once we know the precise definition of a group we can intentionally start to look for groups and it turns out that groups can be applied to many different problems in a variety of fields. For example we can use groups to look at the different ways we can reflect and rotate different shapes 
like equilateral triangles, squares, and so on, without really changing them. To do this, let's first look at all the different permutations that can be applied to a set S with elements 1, 2, and 3. These are the six different permutations that can be applied to this set. If we take the set containing the six different permutations, along with the composition operation, we see that this is a group. If we label the different permutations like this, where the first we will call E to represent the identity element, or the element that changes nothing, the second one we will represent by the Greek letter rho 1, the third by rho 2, and the last three by mu 1, mu 2, and mu 3. Now using this notation, we can compose the operation table that shows all the different possible outcomes when we combine different permutations using the composition operation. From this table, you can see that the set of permutations is closed under the composition operation. Because if you take any two permutations, when you compose them, you end up with another element of the set. And you can see that because every element listed in this table is an element of our original set. Now the identity element is the element E, and you can see on our table that any other element composed with the identity just returns the original element, which is exactly what is required from an identity element. Also, every element contains an inverse, and you can go through and check that in our table. Let's take, for example, mu2. We want to find an element that, when combined with mu2, gives us the identity element. And we see that the element would be mu2, so it's its own inverse. Row 1 has the inverse row 2, and you can do this for every element. Now finally, to be a group, the composition operation must be associative. And it is, because the order in which you compose these permutations will not change the outcome. Now that we have shown that this is a group, let's see how this group might be represented in the physical world. If we look at an equilateral triangle and label the vertices 1, 2, and 3 like this, what we see is that the permutations described above are actually the different ways we can reflect and rotate this triangle symmetrically. To look at one example, one of the permutations sends 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 to 1. This would be represented by rotating our triangle once counterclockwise. Another permutation we looked at sent 1 to 2, 2 to 1, and 3 to 3. This would be represented by reflecting the triangle around the axis of symmetry. So everything we talked about regarding the group of permutations can be applied to the group of symmetries of a triangle. And this idea of finding symmetries and looking for patterns is a big part of group theory, and probably the most natural part of group theory. Not only are groups found in symmetries of different shapes, but they are also used to describe the permutations of roots of polynomials. They are present in the study of molecules, specifically in molecular orbital theory, and they are even used in the study of string theory. So the applications of group theory are really endless, and it really is a great subject to study. So this concludes this video. Hopefully you learned some of the motivations behind studying groups and maybe are even excited about learning more about them. Anyway, thanks for watching and good luck with your studies.